الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم ومن يعمل صالحا من ذكر أو أنثى وهو مؤمن فلنحيينه حياة طيبة آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم As part of our relentless pursuit and tireless quest for perfection and the good life which is the focus of our lectures in these 10 nights man must be able to give up certain pleasures in order to attain greater ones we must put aside our short-term thinking and the approach that some of us have towards the, the, the earthly desires in this world and be able to endure some pain in order to attain some gain. Just like an athlete who goes to the gym, exercises, and through that process, an athlete would have to endure a certain amount of pain. But the athlete ignores the pain for two reasons. One, he knows that in order to attain an athletic, strong, muscular, lean body, he would have to, he would have to endure a little amount of pain. The pain isn't much. He is able to ignore that pain because his ultimate goal is a bigger one. And when he remembers that ultimate goal, the fact that he will end up with a strong muscular body, he ignores this little amount of pain because he is looking for that gain. The second reason is that the time an athlete spends in a gym is considered very short and transient compared to the relatively long-term effects of exercise. The long-term effects of exercise include being healthy, include having a, a strong muscular body, and so forth. And so that short amount of time that is spent in a gym is considered insignificant. And the athlete is prepared to ignore that and not pay too much attention to it because it is only, after all, a very short amount of time compared to a, to a lifetime of healthy lifestyle. When a person drives in a bus or an airplane, the airplane is not exactly a place where you would expect the highest levels of comfort. Yet people are prepared to endure that because they are looking forward to the final destination. Once they disembark from the plane, they will go to their houses or they will go to hotels where, they, where they would have a better atmosphere and more time to feel comfortable, to settle down, and to have a better time. And so this short amount of time that they spend in a bus, a shuttle, a plane, is considered very transient, very short term, and so the ultimate goal justifies the means in this case. What we must understand, as we have explained before, this life cannot be without pain. It cannot be without suffering. This life was never designed to be a perfect utopian paradise. Obstacles, problems, they arise along the way. And incidentally, a life that is dull, where nothing changes, where it's just full of comfort, a mundane life is a very boring one. 
Which is exactly why people go out there and they engage in these adventurous trips and uh, they, they, they actually create challenges for themselves along the way. They create challenges because they know that a life without challenges, a life without obstacles is a boring life. Even the rich and the famous are prepared to put all the comfort behind and go out on these adventurous trips and safaris and so forth. Because a life where made, a life that maintains a constant level of comfort is a very boring one. Because we as human beings, we quickly get used to something. And as soon as we get used to it, it becomes mundane. When it becomes mundane, it becomes boring. When it becomes boring, people just can't stand it anymore, even if it's a very good, comfortable life. What we must understand is that this world, my friends, is not perfect utopian paradise. There are always challenges. There are always difficulties. There are always obstacles that come in our way. And the way toward perfection, and this adds a flavor to life. This also brings life out of a state of being mundane. It also pushes us towards our limits and towards the edge and so that we would become better human beings. Someone comes up to Imam Asad, peace and blessings be upon him, and he says to the Imam, there's something that I need and I, needed your, I, I need you to pray for me. The Imam, because he has been endowed with the wisdom and the knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows what that man wants the Imam to pray for. So the Imam simply tells him, do not ask that which is impossible. So the man out of amazement, because he realized the Imam knows what he asked for, he says, what do you mean, O oh grandson of the Prophet? The Imam tells him, you are asking for comfort in this life. But comfort is something that Allah has never created and will never create, neither for the bad servants nor for the good ones. You just can't have a perfectly comfortable life. It hasn't happened to anyone. It hasn't happened to the kings and to the queens and to the emperors and to the different you know, royal dynasties that have existed in the past. People who had the means, people who had the money, people who had the manpower, and yet they were never able to create a perfectly serene and tranquil lifestyle for themselves. So you, can, you can't ask Allah for something that He has never created and has vowed never to create on this lowly earth and in this life. It'll happen in the future. It'll happen on the other side. It'll happen at the end of the tunnel. It'll happen after you die, if and only if you prove to be a good, loyal servant of your Creator. If not, then you're not going to have a perfect life in this world just as everybody else doesn't have a perfect life. And in the hereafter, you will endure everlasting pain, God forbid. Now why, again, we beg the question, why is there pain in this world? We realize that there is pain, that we have to deal with it, that we have to treat pain as a transient and a temporary state, which will stop at one stage in the future. It'll stop. It'll be either us that will depart this world and the pain will simply cease to exist or the pain will stop by the will of Allah. We realize that. But why is there pain when Allah, in the verse that we recite at the beginning of every lecture in this series, Allah promises us that if we do good while we have faith, be it man or woman, we will have a good life. This is exactly what Allah says. These are the exact same words of the Almighty, all merciful Allah in the Holy Quran. You do good, whether you're a man or a woman, while you have faith, will give you a good life. So where's the good life? Where is it? Where's the promise? Allah has given us not just a promise, but a covenant. A covenant that if you do good, and you have faith, and notice the difference between the two. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have an extra dot in the Quran. Everything's perfect. Every word was meant to be revealed to the Prophet of Islam. But yet he says, 
that you have to do good and you have to have faith. So it's two components that comprise the package we call Islam. The first is faith, the second is good deeds. And I'll get to that in the future, inshallah. Why do we not have a perfect good life? Well, simply, my brothers and my sisters, because we do not follow Islam. We do not follow Islam in its entirety. You know, a lot of us might be good, God-believing, God-fearing Muslims, generally speaking, in quotation marks. Generally speaking, we're good, inshallah. And so, generally speaking, we have good, comfortable lives. And yet we have problems, we have obstacles, we have challenges. Simply because we don't follow Islam to the last word. You ask someone about something that they ignore in this religion and in this faith. They tell, oh, well, you know, I do everything except for that and I'm just not convinced yet. And besides, this isn't that important, that important anyway. So hijab is not important anymore. Praying is not important. Fasting is not important. Going to hajj is not important. We do everything in this life, and hajj is like, you know, the last thing we ever think about doing. And so when we do that, when we actually say that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you think my injunctions are not important? Well, you are not important to me anymore. We insult Allah's injunctions. Allah therefore lets others insult us. Why is it that we live in such a sorry state in the Islamic world? Why is there so much pain? You know, I really don't like these conspiracy theories. You know, when we have problems, we say, oh, because the world hates us, because, you know, the imperialist powers want to destroy us, because the, uh, you know, the evil people want to annihilate the Muslim nation. You know, that could be true to a certain extent. You know, we have enemies. But then again, everybody else has enemies. There is not a person in the world who's, who's in a complete harmonious um, relationship with everybody else. People have problems too. People have enemies too. Why is it that we, we out of everyone else in the world, live in such a sorry state? Why? Because we don't follow Islam. Islam, my friends, is a holistic package composed of hundreds of thousands of components. If you take out one of those components, then you could do more harm than good. If you didn't follow Islam in the first place, you'd probably be in a better state. Why? Because Allah rewards you for your good deeds. If you have any, Allah rewards you for them in this world. Someone is seen on the streets of Medina, and Imam al-Sadat approaches that person, and he's got a lot of, you know, a big crowd around him, and they're all watching in amazement to see what this man has to do. And what he would do is that he'd tell everyone, what he's holding in his hands, for example. He would tell everyone's intentions, you know, and this is, you know, a pretty amazing thing to, to do for someone to know what you are thinking about right now. He would have to be, you know, he would have to have miraculous powers. And so the Imam walks by, and then the Imam tells him, what's in my right hand? And he mentions what was in the right hand of the Imam. He tells him that. And the Imam then asked him, he said, how did you get this power, this miraculous ability to tell what is going through people's minds and to tell the unseen. The unseen world, the metaphysical world, my friends, is a world from which we are barred. We cannot reach out to the other end. And so the Imam asked him, how did you get this ability? He said, well, I looked within myself and whatever my soul, whatever my ego, whatever my desires wanted, I kept, I kept them away from it. In other words, if I wanted to, you know, uh, go out of the park and play, waste some time, for example. This is what I desire, this is what I wish, and therefore I went against this desire, and I didn't do that. If I didn't want to do something, then I del deliberately went out and did it. In other words, I defied my desires and my temptations, and so I had this ability. Now this person was an infidel, an atheist who didn't believe in God. You know, all the more reason for people, for people to be amazed at, at this miraculous ability. He doesn't believe in God and yet he can reach out
to the unseen world. Everyone was amazed. So when he said that to the Imam, when he revealed his secret, the Imam told him, okay, well, I invite you to the religion of Islam. He said, no, not that. I can't do that. I can't become a Muslim. It's just too hard. It's too difficult. That means I'm going to have so many obligations that I need to fulfill. That means I need to pray five times a day. That means I, I need to pay alms to the poor. That means, that means I need to go to Hajj, you know, uh, once in my lifetime. It's just too, too difficult. I can't do it. The Imam said to him, does your ego wish for it to become a Muslim or not? He said, no, I don't want to be a Muslim. I don't like to be a Muslim. The Imam then told him, if that is the case, and you said that your secret of the trade is that you defy the desires and the wishes of your ego, then now is a time where you should embrace Islam. Because your inner ego says, I don't want to be a Muslim. But you said you defy that, that you, you know, go against that all the time. And so I think this is the time you become a Muslim. And so he gave in. And he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Wow! Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Once he did that, he lost the ability to tell the unseen. He lost that miraculous power that he had. And so he came back to the Imam and he said, I lost it. It's gone. I don't have that ability, that ability anymore. People ask me what they're holding and I have no idea. The Imam told him, that was because at the time you were not a Muslim, you had good deeds. Because remember, he defied his desires and his wishes. You had good deeds. And so Allah wanted to reward you in this world. Because remember, Allah is just. Allah is just. He does not overlook any good deed. It doesn't matter who it, it's coming from. Being a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew or an atheist. A good deed is a good deed. It doesn't matter who's performing it, who's doing it. And so Allah wanted to reward you in this world, but not in the hereafter. But now that you're a Muslim, Allah will reward you in the hereafter. And therefore He's taken away this ability that you have. It's difficult. And so you ask people, this isn't enough? People have problems because they don't follow Islam. Brothers are asking me to get you all to stand up to make more
After a while, as you know, there were lots of Jewish tribes around the city of Medina. The Prophet, once having established his base, he made a declaration, an announcement. He said, and I challenge you all to find a government today that provides the same services that the Prophet of Islam provided 1400 years ago. Now as you all know in modern governments, and especially Western governments, what they do is that they have a social security system whereby if there is a poor family or a poor individual who cannot provide for himself, someone who's out of work, someone who's unemployed, someone who's sick, a you know single parent families, these people have a difficult time providing for themselves. And so the governments have set up these initiatives where they have a social security system and the government actually pays the poor families or the poor individuals so that they would stay above the poverty line. Now, the Prophet says in that announcement that he made after he established his base, he said that if there is a family who loses the breadwinner, say the father dies for example, a widow is left with three children and obviously they can't provide for themselves. The Prophet said that we will provide for them whatever they need. Now, in these Western governments, if there's a poor family, the government does have a social security system to, pro to provide, you know, at least some of their needs, but not everything they need. You know, for example, they might need a car. The government's not going to give them a car. They might need, you know, um, extra clothes for the for the aid, for example, for the for Christmas. The government's not going to give them that. The government has a set quota and a set amount of money that they give to the poor families, right? The prophet said that if there's a family who loses its breadwinner, we will provide them whatever they need, as much as they need. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if the breadwinner dies, passes away. And he owes people money. Again, there is not a single government that does that. Or before that, if someone, if someone dies and he leaves an inheritance. Usually, if in most governments, if not all, in most countries, what happens is, if you leave an inheritance, the government charges a small amount of tax on that inheritance. Say you pass away and you have 100,000 pounds, the government usually takes, you know, at least five, ten percent of that inheritance and the rest goes to the family, to the orphans, to the widow. Whereas, the, you know, there could be governments that charge less, there are governments that charge more. There are governments that charge as, as high as seventy percent is taken from the inheritance money. And so the family is left with not much really. And that is the case in most countries. The Prophet said in that declaration, that if someone passes away and they leave an inheritance, the entire amount is transferred to his family. We will not charge them anything, not half a percent. Now, you might say there could be a government out there somewhere that doesn't, doesn't charge any taxes. Okay, but what about this? The Prophet says, if that person leaves nothing for his family, we will provide for them whatever they need. And if you say that there is a government out there that does that and provides that kind of service, what about the third declaration where the Prophet says that if someone that and penny will be provided by the Islamic government, leave the family alone. This is an Islamic system. When we call for an Islamic system, this is what we want. Whereas you look at the state of the Islamic governments around the world these days, they're nowhere near that type of system, to say the very least. And they charge all these taxes, you know, apart from the homes and the zakat, which is an obligation upon every Muslim, but apart from that, they charge all these extra taxes. You know, you have customs duties, you have, sometimes you import a car, and they charge you twice the money you pay for the car, just so you can bring it into the streets. And yet, the economies are in a very bad state. Under an Islamic system, the economy flourishes. Under an Islamic system, everyone owns a house. Because as we said earlier, in the, in the previous nights, everyone becomes a landowner by simply putting the effort into building or cultivating a piece of land. Imam Ali, 
before he was martyred, he said, Imam Ali used to govern, remember this my friends, he used to lead 50 of today's nations. From the North, North African states of Libya and Egypt to the former Soviet province of Dagestan were all under his reign. Imam Ali controlled all these countries. He had a thousand state governors. A thousand states. How many states does this country have? A thousand of them Imam Ali had all under his jurisdiction and under his direct control and power. And yet he makes the claim and no one objects to him. No one gets up and says, no, that is not a correct claim. Even though Imam Ali had given them full freedom, anyone could have got up and said, no, you're wrong. Imam Ali was the type of person who would tolerate his most bitter enemies. He'd be sitting on the pulpit giving a sermon when a crowd of you know, people walk into the mosque and remember, he is the emperor that leads 50 of today's nation. So there must have been thousands of people listening to his lecture and his sermon. So this crowd of demonstrators who were none other than the Kharijites, they would walk in the mosque and they would chant all these slogans against Imam Ali and his government. And they would say that, you know, government does not belong to you, Ali, it belongs to the Almighty Allah. You are not fit to lead. No one is fit to lead. This was their philosophy, which is obviously wrong. You have to have a leader of every nation. You cannot have a nation without a, without a proper government. Be it elected or otherwise, a government has to be in place. Otherwise, you get a total case of anarchy. And mayhem and chaos takes over the government. So, they start chanting all these slogans. And Imam Ali simply stops giving the sermon. He sits quietly. And then they want to intimidate the Imam even more. So they say, Al-Hukmu Lillah wa an Abu Hassan. Government belongs to Allah, none other than Allah, even if Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abu Hassan, even if Imam Ali objects to that. Imam Ali very calmly is sitting down and he says, La Abu Hassan, I don't object to that. Government does belong to Allah. And so Imam Ali had given them all this freedom. Anyone could have got up and said, no, the claim you are making is wrong. And Imam Ali made this claim. He said, I have given every single citizen in my country a house to live in. This is an Islamic government. We impose extra taxes. We oppress the people. We do things that we're not supposed to do. Of course we're going to end up with a government which is dysfunctional and a population which is below the poverty level. It is the action of our own hands, my friends. And so we say this is not important, that's not important, this is not important. Faith is in the heart, a claim that we hear these days quite commonly. Oh, faith is supposed to reside in the heart. That's all that matters, the heart. For the heart to remain pure and good. Your action doesn't matter. Hijab isn't important anymore. I remember I walked into a dentist's office once. The dentist, he was a friend of mine. It was my first time into his surgery. And... He looked at me and he was a bit surprised to see me. So he, he introduced me to his secretary. And he said, uh, this is Carrie, and uh, she's one of us. And I thought, one of us? What, what does he mean by that? One of us as in, she's also a fellow human being? Oh, hello, earthlings. <laughs> she's a human being, all right, but one of us as in a fellow Muslim sister? Because I seriously couldn't see the resemblance between the description we see in the Holy Quran of modesty and chastity with this woman, because she looked like any other 18-year-old, you know, blue eyes, blonde hair, with, with her belly button showing. And she's one of us. What do you mean by that? I'm not talking about the faith that she holds and the beliefs that she has in her heart. Because frankly, I, I can't be judgmental. I'm not the one that judges that. Allah is the only being out there that can make that judgment. But faith, my friends, is supposed to be translated into our action. Faith needs to come out and be reflected on our outside appearance. No, she's not one of us. She could be a Muslim in her heart. 
And that's you know, all well and good, and I, I, I respect that. But she didn't look like, she didn't exactly fit the description we see of Fatima al Zahra, for example, when she walked out of her house, going towards the mosque in order to deliver her fiery speech, the amazing lecture that she gave, when she walked out, the hadith states, فَلَاتَتْ خِمَارَهَا وَاشْتَمَلَتْ بِجِلْبَابِهَا وَخَرَجَتْ فِي لِمَّةٍ مِنْ حَفَدَتِهَا وَنِسَاءِ قَوْمِهَا تَطَأُ ذُيُولَهَا مَا تَخْرِمُ مِشْيَتَهَا مِشْيَةَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ فَدَخَلَتْ الْمَسْجِدْ فَثُمَّ جَلَسَتْ فَنِيطَتْ دُونَهَا مُلَاءَ There are so many measures that Fatima al-Zahra takes so that no one gets to see her. She wears several layers of hijab. My sister's hijab is not just a piece of cloth. Hijab is a strict code of conduct. Fatima al-Zahra wears several layers of hijab. Then she comes out surrounded by many of her servants and her female relatives. And her dress is dragging along the ground when she gets to the mosque. I mean, I remember her brothers asked me, she said, well, look, Fatima Tazara used to give lectures, didn't she? So, you know, she was out there, she was at the public. I said, Fatima Tazara gave just one lecture, and this is the way she did it. She, she did it. Her dress would drag on the ground, you know, so that there would be absolutely zero possibility of her feet showing, for example. Her face covered, and she'd walk into the mosque, she would sit down, and then there would be a curtain placed between her and the general public. She moaned and everyone started crying when they heard that. This is Fatima to Zahra. Carrie is definitely not like Fatima to Zahra. I mean, when, when do women realize, and I'm talking about non-Muslim women, those who don't believe in the Islamic doctrine, when do they come to the realization that they are enslaving themselves? <clears throat> there was a time when slavery was legal and you know women went through a lot of pain during that, that era. Women were enslaved, they would be abused, but now look at what's happening. Thanks to all those liberation movements, Women are voluntarily offering themselves to be enslaved by others. And they have a good time doing so. They actually enjoy it. And who doesn't? You know, who doesn't enjoy the extra publicity and the attention and uh, the glamour and all, all, all of that? Who doesn't? You know, what price? What is the price they're paying? I asked the brother today, and I said to him, uh, are you into tennis at all? And he said, yeah, pretty much. We have the Wimbledon here. I said, okay, what about women's tennis championships? Professional women's tennis championships? He said, yeah. I said, okay, can you mention um, one of the uh, professional women's champions, you know, tennis players? And he sat there for a while, and he said, uh, that, that, what's her name, the Russian girl? I said, bingo, Anna Kornikova. Why is it, now seriously, I have nothing against Miss Kornikova, and I sure as hell have nothing against the tennis as, as a game. Um, I enjoy it myself sometimes. And I, frankly, I can't afford a defamation lawsuit alleging that I insulted her or anything. But I would, I would, I would have to say that um, she is a terrible role model, and what really amazes me is how come when you, when you mention professional women's ten, tennis, the, the first name that pops up is Anna Kornikova. Why is it her all the time? Do you know how many Grand Slam titles she's won? Anyone? Not a single Grand Slam title. She's not, she doesn't even make the top 100 list. Not even the top 300 for crying out loud. I mean, why didn't you remember, I said to my friend, what about the, the, uh, the Williams sisters, for example? Serena and Venus Williams, or Jennifer Capriati, who are you know, the top three players. Why does it have to be 
Anna Kornikova, the Russian girl. Well, it's simple. It's all about market economics. You see, game organizers, they don't, they don't just rely on ticket sales, but they also rely on TV ratings. They have to have good TV ratings to survive. And so they need a good marketing strategy. And that's exactly when little, good old Miss Kornikova comes in to save the day. How? Well, when they want to market, it's, it's essentially a product that they're trying to sell. The product is the game. They're trying to make money out of that. And so those entrepreneurs, what they do is they have to have a good marketing strategy. And that is when the skirts have to get shorter. That's when the spotlights have to be directed at the more attractive players rather than the ones who are, you know, they play good, but they're not as, as attractive as the, you know, the, uh, the, the blonde Russian girl. And that's exactly what you get. People thinking of her all the time when you mention the game, even though, I mean, it's not about her playing skills because she frankly doesn't have any. No, no, I'm serious, because I mean, if she did, she'd win something, wouldn't she? She wouldn't be on the billboards and, you know, uh, magazine covers all the time. She would be on the court winning something. So it's not for the love of the game, as the motto goes. All those entrepreneurs care about is their skin. All they care about is how thick their eyelashes are. All they care about is how attractive their bodies are. That's all they care about. And at what price do they get all the glamour and the, glamour and the attention? What price? The real value of women. Now, again, as I said, um, it's not womanhood that is being sold as a commodity here. Oh no, God forbid that ever happened. No, it's actually women being used in order to market another commodity. How low is that? When do women realize that their worth is not proportionate to how attractive they look? Islam says, women deserve better. You deserve better. You deserve to be treated as well as, you, as who you are as a person. Not as how attractive you look or how tight your skin is. Because that skin, as we all know, will go. Soon wrinkles will start appearing. And when that happens, they will never, ever, you know, mark my words, they will never make the cover of Clio, Vogue, and Cosmopolitan ever again. And that's just further proof that this is all they care about. It's the skin. Who's the victim? Women and the other victims. Men who actually fall for the deception and end up with nothing but a false fantasy which is nothing but hot air. The value of womanhood is degraded, my friends. Women become parties to their own objectification. They degrade themselves even further. Just look at Islam. Look at these role models that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us with. Forget, you know, Kate Moss and Jennifer Aniston and all those people that, you know, have really nothing, no talent whatsoever to offer. All they offer is their skin. Islam provides us with role models such as Fatima al Zahra. Allah provides us with a role model and He mentions her in the Quran. And He says, Allah gives an example to those who believe. Now, notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying Allah is giving an example to the women who believe or the men who believe. No. This is a general example from which we, all, we can all learn. The wife of the Pharaoh. Pharaoh Ramses II. What about her? Here we have a chaste woman, a modest woman, a God fearing, God believing woman. 
A woman who had all the means to enjoy herself. After all, she was the wife of a person who claimed to be God of the world. And she would have had everything she ever wanted. And yet, what did she want? She said, oh Allah, build me a house in paradise next to you. That is, under the shadow of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want Pharaoh, I don't want his money, I don't want the comfort that I receive in his vicinity, I want you, O oh Allah. I want a house in paradise next to you. What did Pharaoh do to her? Pharaoh actually arrested her, he had her tortured, and at the end, he had someone bring a, a, a very long nail and he inserted that nail into her eye and then the next eye and then finally into her heart and killed her. This was Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. This is the role model for all of us to follow. Not those celebrities that have nothing to offer but their skin. Islam, notice this, subhanAllah, Imam Ali gives the best description of a woman in the Holy Quran, in, in one of his traditions. He says, <laughs> And there is so much we can extrapolate from this very short sentence. A woman is a flower. Now, the first thing we can learn is that a woman can be a beautiful person that can make the difference between a happy, loving family and a dysfunctional one. We can also learn that with beauty comes delicacy, comes weakness. But is that weakness bad or is it good? The difference between a flower and an iron rod is clear. You say that the flower is delicate. The delicacy itself is a part of its beauty. An iron rod is tough. But who would want to be an iron rod? Would you not rather be a beautiful, delicate flower or an iron rod? <laughs> delicacy sometimes, I mean, it's really unfortunate. People look at us and as Muslim, Muslims that is, especially with Muslim women. I know you get all the gamuts of, you know, uh, strange looks and stares and the occasional comments you hear whispered here and there and uh, you know it is true they look at you most of the time and they either see you as a poster girl for oppressed womanhood everywhere in the world or they see you as a militant terrorist who's hacking an AK-47 assault rifle in her jean jacket that is the way we are looked at no I'm serious I mean we were in Sydney, and uh, at the time, one of the uh, one of the local ministers, one of the state ministers, he was a priest, and he actually made the call for the Muslim hijab to be banned from uh, strategic areas such as the inner city area, the uh, central business district. And he said, "Well, we have to do this so that women don't carry assault rifles beneath beneath their abaya, as we call it." And he, you know, mentioned the example of the Chechen women and so forth. This is the way we're looked at. We are seen as terrorists and militants. I had a good friend of mine, he, um, he said that I had a speech um, that I had to deliver to a group of non-Muslims and uh, I started the speech like this. Hi, I'm a Muslim and uh, I'm a terrorist and I'm a militant and I'm going to drink your blood like a vampire. And he said, everyone started looking at each other, what the hell is this guy on about? And I said, well, you watch the news, you read the newspapers, you know, this is what they want to have you believe. Do you, do you believe that? Is, that? is that the case? But of course it's not. They want to take away the hijab because they see it either as a symbol of oppressed womanhood or they, they see it as uh, something with which women can conceal their militant and terrorist personality. Of course that's wrong. We see hijab as the most liberating thing a woman can wear. Where your worth is not proportional to how attractive you look. Well, you don't have to worry about how 
others are looking at you, whether they like your hairstyle, whether you just came out of the salon or not, or whether, you know, um, how, how your body looks, uh, do you look weightfish or not weightfish, do you look, do you have you know, slim hips or not slim hips, or, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. You reserve the choice to keep that to yourself. And that is the most liberating thing a woman can do. When she becomes respected for who she is, not how attractive she looks. You look at examples in the Islamic faith. The women that accompanied Imam Hussein to the desert of Karbala, each one of them was a true heroine. Not a heroine that goes out there like an iron rod and fights in the battlefield. No. A heroine in her devotion to her Imam. A heroine in the true men that she gives birth to, and she raises, and she teaches, a heroine that can act as an example for all of us to follow, men and women. A woman, on the day of Ashura, she's standing right next to her son. Her son's 11 years old. Whenever I, I, I remember the story, I just have to shed tears, because it's unbelievable the amount of faith that this woman has in her heart. An 11-year-old boy that she has given birth to, that she has spent countless sleepless nights to raise, he's standing next to her. She's looking at the battlefield and the war is erupted. Her husband dies, who's the father of that, of that boy. So what she does is, she says to her son, did you see your daughter, your father just get killed? He said, yes, mother, I saw that. She says, okay, what are you waiting for? Go out there and help your Imam and your master, Imam Hussein. Then she takes him and she dresses him with his armor. She gives him a sword. He's only 11 years old. He can hardly carry the weapon and the sword. She gives him a sword in his right hand and she says, off you go. Go to your master. Seek permission and go. then go fight on the battlefield, battlefield and die protecting your Imam. He goes to the Imam and he says to him, I want to go to the battle and fight. The Imam says, this boy's father has just been killed. Take him back to his mother. She must miss him right now. She's probably looking for him. He says, Ya Abu Abdullah, my mother was the one who sent me to you. He says, no, take him back to his mother. He goes back to his mother. When she sees him, she says, what are you doing back here? I thought I told you to go and fight. He says, Imam Hussein sent me back. He said, he probably thought you were too young to fight. Come with me. She holds his hand in one hand and she holds his sword in the other and she drags him all the way to Imam Hussein where he's standing and he is looking at the battlefield, all of his children dead, all of his companions dead. He has no one to protect him anymore. And she says, Ya Abu Abdullah, let my son go fight and die in your way. He says, his father has just died. She says, Ya Abu Abdullah, أَتُذْكَلُ أُمُّكَ الزَّهْرَى بِوَلَدِهَا وَلَا أُذْكَلُ بِوَلَدِهِ Your mother, I can't sit there and see your mother, Fatima to Zahra, mourn her son while I don't mourn mine. My son has to go out there and fight any way until he dies. And Imam Hussein cries and gives him permission to go. He goes out there. His name is not mentioned in history. All we know of him, he doesn't even introduce himself. He goes out there and he recites the famous poem, Amiri Hussein wa na'am al-Amir, Salil Fu'ad al-Bashir al-Nadir. He doesn't say who I am, he says my master is Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam. He goes out there and he fights, he kills a few of those vicious animals, then he dies. They decapitate him, they sever his head and throw it towards his mother. His mother holds the head, she kisses it and then she says, thank you my son, for you have given your life and the way of your master Imam Hussein. I can finally, on the day of judgment, I can look in the eyes of Fatima to Zahra and cry. And I say, oh Fatima, your son died in Karbala, but so did mine, saving him. That is one woman. Another woman is the wife is of, of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn is a man on the Uthmani school of thought. He accused Imam Ali of killing Uthman. He hated Imam Ali, he hated Imam Hassan, he hated Imam Hussein. In one of the stopover stations along the way towards Kufa, he meets with Imam Hussein. 
He has his own tent. He's sitting there with, with his wife, his brother, and his mother. Imam Hussein sends a messenger towards his tent, and he says to him, the messenger says, answer the call to your Imam. He says, you know, this is what I've tried to avoid. I don't want to go see him. His wife is sitting down. She says, how could you not answer the call of your Imam when he's, when he's calling you? He's asking you to go. Get up and go to your Imam. And so he feels humiliated. He stands up, he goes towards Imam. He enters the Imam's tent while being a Uthmani. But he leaves the tent only a few moments later while being a Husseini. He goes back to his tent. He says to his wife, you are now divorced. I want you to go with my brother and my mother because I will not be returned. I will go with my master and I, I will die protecting him. His wife says, how could you leave me? Go and die in the way of protecting your imam while you let me go back to my comfortable life. I swear to God I won't let you go by yourself. If Lady Zainab has to be enslaved and she has to be captured, so will I. And she hits her head against the pillar and the pole in the tent and she starts bleeding and she says, this is a sign of my devotion. I want to be enslaved along with Lady Zainab. And so he takes her along with him. This is another woman. A third one is the wife of Wahab al-Kalbi. She was a Christian and so was he. He meets Imam al-Hussein and he instantly revert and he instantly becomes a Muslim. He becomes a Muslim. His wife remains a Christian and so and, and they were really they were newlyweds. They had just got married only a few days before. It's the it's the start of her of her married life. She wants to enjoy life, but her husband reverts to Islam. He tells her that I'm going with Imam Hussein and I'm going to protect him until my blood is shed, until I die. She begs him not to go. She grabs his clothes and she says, please don't leave me alone. Please don't make me widow. Please don't go. He says, no, I have to go. This is my duty and I'm going to follow to the very end. He goes towards Imam Hussein. He joins his camp and then on the day of Ashura, he goes out there. Again, she begs him and he leaves her behind. He goes back. His mother is standing. His mother also reverts to Islam and his mother keeps telling him, don't listen to her. Go out there and make me proud in front of Fatima to Zahra. He goes out while his wife is screaming. She's begging him. He goes out, he fights, and all of a sudden he hears his wife having a different tone altogether. His wife is no longer begging him to come back. She says, Go out there and fight in the way of protecting these good men. He goes back and says, What happened to you? What took place? You have just been begging me to come back, and now you're telling me to go fight and die in the way of these people. He said, don't blame me. Don't blame me, O oh Wahab, because I, the call of Hussein made my heart bleed. I was standing there when I noticed Imam Hussein standing saying, Allah al Allah al and he got killed defending Imam Hussein. You know, tonight we traditionally mourn and commemorate the, the disciples of Imam Hussein, the companions of Imam Hussein who gave everything they had in the way of protecting Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein had companions beyond, beyond description. We cannot even begin to understand how great these people were. One of them, and this is after the tragedy of Karbala, the first person ever to stand up against the tyranny of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Afif. And he's a man that was blinded. One of his eyes was blinded in the battle of Safin while fighting against Muawiyah. The other eye was blinded when fighting in the battle of Jamal, when fighting the enemies of Imam Ali alayhi salam. A very devout, great companion of Imam Ali, a great companion of Imam Hassan, as well as Imam Hussein. Now he was a man who lost both of his eyes in the war. And so he had always wished, wished that he would become a martyr. But upon losing his two eyes, he lost hope of ever becoming a martyr. And so after Imam Hussein got killed, he was sitting in the majlis of, of Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad. When Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad got up on the pulpit and announced the death of Imam Hussein, he said, Alhamdulillah. الَّذِي نَصَرَ أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ referring to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. He said, we thank God 
for having made Amir al-Mu'mineen Yazid ibn Mu'awiyah defeat Al-Kadhab ibn Al-Kadhab, the liar, the son of the liar, Husayn ibn Ali. When this man, Abdullah ibn Afif al-Azdi, when he heard those words, words, he stood up and he said, Al-Kadhab ibn Al-Kadhab, anta wa abuk, wa man ammaraka wa abuk. The liar and the son of the liar is you and your father and the person who made you governor and, and his father. When Ubaidullah heard those words, he said, who is that talking? He said, I am the one talking. He wasn't scared. He said, I am the one who made that call. It's me that you heard. He said, get him and kill him. He sent his troops. His tribesmen protect him until he gets safely to his house. When he enters the house, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad sends his troops and again, again. And at the time, before he goes back to his house, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad says, who are you? And uh, he asked them questions. He said, don't ask me about who I am, but ask me about you and your father. Who are you to accuse Imam Hussein of being a liar and a son of a liar? Who are you? Imam Hussein's father is Ali ibn Abi Talib. His grandfather is Rasulullah. His mother is Fatima al Zahra. But who's your father? His father, Ziyad, didn't even have a father. He was called Ziyad ibn Abi. And he was a man who, whose father was named Ubaid. He was married to his mother, but when he was born, Abu Sufyan said that he's my son and not yours. And so there was, you know, such a big mess in this family. His father's not known, his grandfather's not known. And so he told him, how could you ask me about who I am? Ask me about you and your grandfather, your father and your grandfather. So he sent his troops after him. They chased him to his house. Remember, he's blind. His daughter is waiting in the house. He tells his daughter, these men are coming after me. They want to kill me. I have always longed to be marching in the way of Allah. I lost hope when I lost my two eyes, but now I thank God that I will be killed at the hands of the most vicious, the most filthy man on earth. And so they come after him into the house. He tells his daughter, give me the sword. He takes the sword and his daughter directs him at where the danger is coming. She says, they're after you, they're right next to you, they're on the right hand, they're on the left hand, and he fights and fights until he is killed. These are the men that defended Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura. I swear to God that if we have to give an entire lecture about each and every one of them, we would never finish speaking about them. One of them actually says to Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura, he says that this life is only temporary. But I swear to God that, it's, that if this life was not temporary, if this life was eternal, I would, I would still rather be killed defending you than to live in this lowly earth even if it is for eternity. He's, another person says to Imam Hussein that I would rather be killed, be decapitated, have my body burnt and my ashes thrown and dispersed a thousand times that being repeated upon my body, I would rather be killed in your way even if that has to happen to me. These are the men that defended Imam Hussein. These are the men whose bodies disappeared at the end of the day of Ashura under a cloud of glory. These are, th these are the men that have an inscription on their tombstones that say, we have sacrificed everything we had in the way of Imam Hussein. These are the men, one of whom Muslim ibn Awsaj, one of the best companions of Imam Hussein. He goes out into the battlefield, he fights and then he is heavily wounded. He falls down and he's about to die. Imam Hussein goes towards him along with Habib ibn Mubahra, who is another great companion of Imam Hussein. They go together towards Muslim ibn Awzad who is just about to die. He's breathing his last breaths of life. And Imam Hussein thanks him. He thanks him and he prays for him. Habib ibn Mubahra, they both come from the same tribe. Muslim ibn Awzad and Habib ibn Mubahra. So Habib tells him, Oh Muslim, if only I knew that I would be living any longer than you will, I know that I will be following your way and I will be following your footsteps. I will be dying soon after you. But if there is anything you wish to tell me, if there is any wish that you want me to know about, please tell me, this is the time to tell me. He says to him, Oh Habib, I do not ask you for anything. I do not ask you to take care of my family. I do not ask you for any earthly desires, but I ask you for one thing, and there is only one wish in my heart, and that is for you to die defending this lonely man. And he, and he pointed towards Imam Hussein, 
alayhi salam. This man will be lonely. He will be left on his own, O oh, Habib. So please do everything you can and die in the way of defending him. Well, I ask Muslim now, and I ask Habib ibn Mubarak, and I ask Wahab al Kalbi, and I ask all these loyal companions, where were you? On the afternoon of Ashura, when Imam Hussein looked to the, towards the right and then towards the left, left, and he saw nothing but butchered bodies, severed heads, and he called out, Ah, Ya Abdullah, Astafa, Ya Fursan al Hayja, Mani Unadi, Kumfala, Tuji Moon. What am I called upon you? But you do not respond. Thank you.